Let's go Talos. My name is Mitch Neff with the Cisco Talos Strategic Communications Group. Today, we're excited to share with you the final featured section of the first ever Talos Year in Review Report. This report represents a large scale effort within Talos to tell the story of our work across the last year. It's a lengthy report, it's 60 some pages to be sure, but one you'll probably wanna go through completely. And you can join thousands of your colleagues, friends and customers and download the full report now at blog.talosintelligence.com slash year and review. As always, there's never an email get or charge of any kind for the research that you'll get from talosintelligence.com. This report features the expertise of a talented and diverse and somewhat large group of people, including our reverse engineers, detection specialists, data scientists, linguists, managed hunt providers, incident responders, and of course, our uh, threat intelligence analysts. These folks went back over everything we observed in the threat landscape in 2022 to tell this story that gives you an insight into our and really the security community as a whole's most noticeable successes in 2022 and the remaining challenges as we head into 2023. Uh, the report went live before the holidays, and it already has, as I mentioned, a lot of downloads. So make sure you grab your copy, and you can go through the full report and cover everything that we're going to talk about today, as well as the other three sections of the report that we've already done live streams on. Like I mentioned, it is split into four sections, and this is the last in that series of four, uh, covering the final section of the report. What we're discussing today is the is. Uh, the last but certainly not the least of the issues that defenders face. If anything, it might be the opposite. Uh, in fact, you can't really talk about changes in the modern threat landscape without talking about the trends, evolutions, and activity connected with ransomware and commodity loaders. Uh, the, the share of total threats, if you will, is such that uh, ransomware and, and loaders are so high that you, to discuss one is really to somewhat discuss the other. And today's ransom, uh, excuse me, today's ransomware space is is always changing and a ever dynamic place uh, that changes with changes in the geopolitical environment, uh, actions by our defenders and efforts by law enforcement. And that increased in scope and intensity in 2022. Those macro trends lead, led groups to rebrand under different names, shut down their operations completely and form new strategic partnerships, which only complicates the tenuous work of defending our networks and users. Today, we're going to look at the trends and intelligence used to track those ransomware actors and the loader activity over time. Uh, like I said, the macro trends, the tactics, techniques, procedures, or, or TTPs that we've seen in use, uh, and some key differences between state-aligned activity and cyber criminals conducting their dirty business. We'll also discuss a bit how that line gets very blurry at times. Our panel is going to give some thoughts on the threat landscape as well as we head into 2023 and, and look at those trends going forward. But before we introduce our esteemed panel today, a quick reminder on the Q&A. If you're watching us live, please submit your questions for our panelists through this live stream, either replying to the on Twitter or in the comment section if you're watching us on LinkedIn. If you're watching later on YouTube, uh, well, you might be out of luck on the Q&A. So we'll be gathering the, uh, the, the, chat, the questions we get in the chat window off to the side during the live event. And with the help of our, our many hat wearing producer Madison toward the end of the broadcast, we'll ask you uh, ask your questions of our panelists. So let's go ahead and get on with the show. Uh, for this discussion today, I'm del delighted to be joined by three people who have been actively involved in tracking, documenting, and researching the threats, actors, and groups involved in ransomware and loader attacks. Uh, they've also been instrumental in pulling together the data for our year in review report. First up, we have Azim Hodabayev, Senior Threat Intelligence Analyst for Cisco Talos, who has been a primary contributor to the ransomware and loader section of this report. So starting with you, Azim, let's talk a little bit about your role at Talos and, and some of the things your team does to give a little background. Sure. Um, I work for the uh, Cisco Talos Threat Intelligence and Interdiction Team. I've been there for about seven years. My primary uh, job is to leverage my uh, native capabilities in Russian and collect and analyze as much intelligence and information we can specifically with uh, techniques and procedures of how uh, bad guys, if you will, uh, use to uh, attack Cisco customers and networks and try to uh, prevent uh, these attacks on a larger scale. Uh, our team uh, has is made up of very talented and uh, diverse backgrounds. Uh, that uh, all come together to uh, focus on the mission to protect our customer. 
Awesome. Can you give us a, a, a an overview of what's included in this section of the report uh, and, and maybe touch on why we've grouped ransomware together with commodity loaders for this particular section of the year in review? Yeah. Uh, so commodity loaders uh, definitely have been observed to deliver malware in a different form. Uh, one of the biggest impacts we've seen over the last couple of years, especially the last uh, two years, is the ransomware that's the end stage of many of these uh, commodity loaders uh, uh, attacks. And ransomware has been impactful on a very, very large scale. In fact, impacting critical infrastructure in the United States uh, a little bit over a year, a year and a half ago. So the uh, economic and operational impact is significant. And that's why we focused on this for this report. Fantastic. Next up on the panel today, we have Aliza Johnson, uh, Information Security Engineer at Cisco Talos. Um, Aliza, can you tell us a, a, a bit about your role and, and your approach to malware research? I think you're muted, Allie. Apologies. There um, we go. <laughs> I'm great to be here. Um, uh, so my role in Talos is more along the lines of intelligence collection and analysis. Um, in addition to conducting our own research, my team leads is with people across Talos to get a broad perspective on all the great other teams are doing. We then look at this body of research to provide analytical insights on threat actor behavior and identify and track new and emerging trends. We then document these findings in written products for internal audiences like our sales team, and external audiences like government partners. Awesome. A lot of work there. So how did that team, you and your team, contribute uh, to this year's uh, year in review findings? Um, and I guess along with that, what stood out to you the most uh, looking back on 2022 with respect to, to today's topic, ransomware and loaders? Sure. Um, so I was one of the main authors of the end of year report uh, to draft with this product. We consulted dozens of subject matter experts throughout this because we really wanted this report to reflect all the work that they're doing and let data drive our narrative. Um, our goal was to holistically look at the past year and identify major trends in the security landscape, the top threats to our customers, and the most important security events Cisco responded to, for example, threats stemming from the war in Ukraine. Um, over the past year, what stood out to me the most personally was how adaptable adversaries have become in response to external stimuli, like shifts in the geopolitical landscape, actions from law enforcement, and the efforts of security defenders to keep networks safe. Um, these stimuli have caused cyber actors to change their tools and cyber tactics and force some groups to fall apart while providing other groups with the opportunity to thrive. Um, this is interesting to me because adversaries used to be the ones actually driving change in the threat landscape by developing new tools and exploits, et cetera. But more and more we're seeing these actors are the ones being forced to respond and adapt. Hmm. Also on the panel today, I kind of have some follow-up questions on that. Uh, mm -hmm. Also on the panel today, uh, we have Nick Biasini, head of Talos Outreach. Uh, Nick, welcome back to our live streams. Uh, an oft guess. Uh, your your name appears a lot uh, over the over time in in our ransomware and loader research, uh, going back over the years. So, if you could tell our, our viewers today, um, kind of what's your role in Talos and what's been your role in these uh, ransomware and loader research efforts? Absolutely, Mitch. Thanks for having me uh, yet again. Thanks for being here. <laughs> I as I said, I am the head of outreach, so I run a team of threat researchers. Our real goal is public facing research. So if you see a blog, a white paper, we were big contributors to the year in review as well. But most of the public facing content that you see out of Talos is either originating from one of the people on my team or one of the people on my team is involved. As far as loader and ransomware landscape, um, before I was the leader of this team, I was a member of the team and I spent many, many, many years tracking both loaders and ransomware from when it was being dropped out of exploit kits and randomly installed on victims long before cartels existed to now the growth and explosion of cartels, the addition of extortion techniques, now the, the law enforcement involvement in cartels, and then watching loaders change and evolve from, you know, in some cases they were banking Trojans, more pure Trojans. And now today we see most malware having a capability to load additional malware 
because these ransomware cartels and extortion cartels are where the majority of the funding lies today for cyber criminals. I think we'll touch on that again in a second, and that's a that's a good response, Nick. But like the name suggests, and, and like you three have have already kind of alluded to, uh, ransomware and loader groups are are prone to using various and different methods uh, to deploy malware and achieve their ultimate ends. Uh, in addition to that, our, our research has shown uh, from your teams uh, these groups are simultaneously like you said, evolving their business models uh, into things like ransomware as a service uh, and affiliate programs and continuing to adapt to the way defenders uh, are, are responding to them to achieve their goals. Uh, naturally, that increases the difficulty in defense, right? Uh, and even attributing activity to a specific group for tracking purposes, among other things. Um, so let's, Nick, let's go back to you. How, how does Talos, how are we able to monitor, uh, such a diverse set of actors with a diverse set of TTPs and end goals? It's, it's a very multi-pronged approach would be the easiest way to describe that. So there's a variety of different ways that we're doing it. Um, we're obviously doing things like monitoring leak sites for these cartels as they are stood up or taken down. We are actively involved in uh, forums and various other ways to engage with these actors to get a better understanding of what the landscape looks like. We're constantly working with the open source intelligence out there for whatever we're seeing related to ransomware or loader or cartel activity. And then finally, there's also the incident response side of the house where we get additional insights into what we're seeing on the ground. One of the biggest challenges as well is not just tracking the cartels, but trying to keep track of affiliates as they pivot and move between these groups. It's incredibly difficult because each affiliate has their own TTPs. And as they shift between groups, suddenly what was once associated with one ransomware variant is now associated with a new cartel as an affiliate maybe moves between them. Hmm. And I, I, I... Presumably that that generates an immense amount of data uh, and and at the end intelligence. So how do we use all that research and everything we're generating from that to create actual intelligence um, for our customers? And and kind of along with that, uh, I, I want to touch back on something that you, you also mentioned. So in creating that intelligence, we've also, uh, and we talked about this right before the live stream, decided to call these commodity loaders as opposed to, uh, I guess, the more traditional or common term or what they used to be known as banking Trojans. Um, so I, I know those two things are kind of related. Like we, we've changed that name to commodity loaders, uh, mm -hmm. but that's related to how we use that research. So start with maybe how do we use that research to create actionable intelligence and how that lead us to, to kind of change how we refer to that? So the, the, we'll create intelligence out of a lot of different ways. So the, obviously for the ransomware variants, for the, the bespoke malware or tooling that the groups are using, we will have signature-based detection to detect that type of activity. We'll obviously continue doing things like block listing domains and IPs as they get stood up. Uh, we continue to proactively try and get ahead of what these groups are doing to try and understand if any major operations are potentially ongoing and providing that intelligence to our customers so that they can be prepared accordingly. Uh, now, related to the banking Trojan side of the house, the, the easiest way to look at this is these types of malware, and, and commonly we're talking about things like Quackbot, ice to id uh, TrickBot, th those types of malware families, Imitet. If you go back, a lot of these threats have existed for a very long time, for years, if not a decade or more. If you go back a decade, the majority of your revenue on the crimeware landscape was associated with banking Trojans and stealing banking credentials and emptying banking accounts. As time has gone on, we now see that the majority of the monetization is coming through not the banking Trojan side of the house, but from ransomware and extortion attacks. These long-lived malware families are long-lived for a reason. They are going to continue to follow where the money is. And that's exactly what they did. They added capabilities to load malware. They added capabilities to diversify the ways that they can deliver payloads. And that's one of the reasons why we label them more generally as loaders today. They don't really have banking Trojan capabilities anymore. Hmm. Um, Azim, I'm going to ask that same question to you. Yeah, just to touch on uh, 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 what Nick uh, or already expanded on and the cartel model, 
Um, uh, historically, going back a few years, we've seen that uh, ransomware operations were done by uh, individual or small group, cyber criminal groups, and then they expanded to uh, pretty much overtake the entire process to maximize their profits. Um, and they were pretty uh, successful in their goals as far as uh, achieving major payouts from victims. Um, what, what was interesting is how uh, commodity loaders played into that. They realized the efficiency, I think, of commodity loaders and how ransomware could be deployed in a very fast and impactful way. Um, and uh, it was only a matter of time before some of these commodity loaders uh, were either uh, crossed path or consolidated into ransomware cartels. One example I can give you, uh, just about a year ago, we saw the uh, Russian ba Russia-based uh, ransomware group Conti that uh, allegedly took over the TrickBot operations um, and uh, allowed, which allowed them to remove a lot of middlemen uh, and consolidate business operations to maximize these profits, as I mentioned. Um, that kind of uh, evolution, um, given that the you know cyber criminals are, are free to operate and switch over to different affiliates and switch over to different commodity loaders is inevitable and i think that uh, the the convergence of them is um, is definitely in the near future kind of ironic that following the money took them away from banking trojans if, <laughs> if you think about it yeah uh, it seems like uh it was just the we easiest and fastest way to make money was uh using these commodity loaders and yeah. deploy ransomware and that's it yeah. Aliza, uh, same question. Sure. Well, I don't think there's too much more to be said about uh, banking Trojans, but um, to answer your question on um, how we use research to create actionable intelligence for our customers, um, I'd just like to say that our efforts to understand the cyber threat landscape and how it's changing have really helped us preemptively protect our customers instead of just waiting for them to experience a compromise and then helping them after the fact with remediation. Um, I feel that you know what threat actors are out there, which entities they might target and their tools and TTPs, um, then we'll have an idea of what malicious activity to protect them from. Um, and if a compromise does happen, we know what activity to look for so we can intervene early and minimize the potential damage. Very cool. Uh, Azim, I'm going to come back to you. Uh, yeah. We've talked already a lot about different actors and, and different groups and kind of the amorphous relationship between them. But uh, in the report, we, we've actually we've called out several of the top ransomware groups as well as the top commodity loaders that we saw as being active throughout 22. Uh, would you be able to give us kind of a, a high level overview uh, of those threats that we mentioned in the report? Yeah, so as I touched on, uh, the end stage uh, of the, some of these commodity loaders was ransomware, and it became so impactful that uh, it was a, uh, the, the, the activity just demanded that we looked in, into it. Um, not only that, uh, these commodity loaders are not limited just to ransomware, but could be indirectly uh, deploying malware that ultimately leads to ransomware. For example, uh, reinforced dealers are known to be associated with some of these commodity loaders and campaigns uh, and are deployed for uh, massive collection of credentials, massive collection of opportunities for uh, to be sold or traded or transferred in every different way in some of these cyber criminal spaces uh, for other activity, which ultimately most often uh, is ransomware. Um, or attempts for ransomware deployment. And so that kind of uh, uh, convoluted relationship uh, between commodity loaders and other different types of malware that could indirectly reach ransomware definitely uh, spiked interest for uh, myself and our team to constantly keep an eye on because we see a direct impact um, on our customers, intel intelligence partners, and the overall community. Fantastic. Elisa, um, coming back to you, uh, from your research looking at, uh, you know, obviously we talked about a large volume of data from, from many varied sources. Can you summarize the main ransomware and loader behavior trends, uh, how they acted, uh, found in, in cyber attacks this last year? Sure. Um, so over the past year, we saw a lot of organizations changes among cyber criminal groups in that we saw new groups emerging, existing groups shut down their operations, um, or even existing groups rebranding themselves under new names. 
Uh, for ransomware groups, one significant factor that drove these changes was the war in Ukraine. Many cyber criminal groups expressed strong public support for either Russia or Ukraine and altered their activity to support the war effort, which caused internal fighting among members who disagreed with those political stances. We also saw more ransomware affiliates enter the threat arena as ransomware became more accessible for purchase on underground forums. This resulted in an influx of new cyber criminals who don't belong to a specific ransomware group and instead support multiple campaigns and organizations. Regarding commodity loaders, they were more impacted by international law enforcement efforts to crack down on cyber criminal activity, which forced some groups to shut down or suspend their activity. Um, as some of the major players like Emotet were impacted by these efforts, affiliates looked for other loaders to fill that space. And so malware like Quackbot and Iced ID became more popular. Iced ID, good one. Mm -hmm. uh, so is that is that something that is we saw as like being new and different in 22? Or, or how would you say those behavior trends have evolved uh, over time or from past years? Yeah, well, things um, used to be a lot more stable. In past years, the threat landscape was monopolized by a select few ransomware groups that were heavily structured in silos. Um, more structured groups also means a more defined set of TTPs and targets, which made these groups easier to identify and track. By comparison, in the past year, we've tracked almost 20 different ransomware groups, which we cover in the year in report. Um, commodity loaders are a little bit different since we haven't seen the number of new groups explode like with ransomware, uh, but due to law enforcement activities, we have seen groups um, that have been around for years start to struggle, like Emotet um, was shut down for several months, and it's also become more common for affiliates to move in between groups. So the whole space, um, uh, ransomware, commodity loader, cyber criminal threat space has become more dynamic in the past year. Interesting. So the 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 global geopolitical environment grew increasingly complex uh, over the course of, of 2022, as as Elise just said, and state sponsored and or rather state aligned uh, ransomware and loaders also adapted. Um, I'm hearing that we saw rifts, changes, shifting alliances. Uh, Azim, you, you have a special research interest, as you mentioned, in, in Russia, Russia line based uh, ransomware as a service operators and threat actors in general, uh, especially in connection with the, the war in Ukraine this year. Can you tell us how ransomware or the loaders that we observed um, were how they were observed to change with or take advantage of that complex geopolitical environment? Right. Uh, so that's a really good question. Um, we definitely saw a significant Fair warning. I'm going to ask you, Nick and Elisa as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better get ready, guys. Uh, it's uh, it, it actually was a, a significant impact. But um, from the uh, war in Ukraine that started just about a year ago, I would actually like to take us back to about six months before that. Um, with the colonial pipeline attacks that were a very, very significant event in the ransomware world. That really put up uh, the importance and the impact of what ransomware can do to the global and especially um, um, uh, to the level of American law enforcement. Um, since then, there's definitely been a very uh, significant disruption into the ransomware world and as Eliza touched on uh, a somewhat a reconsolidation once the war in Ukraine uh, occurred uh, we know we've we've known that there was a significant amount of cybercrime activity in that part of the world not specifically limited to Russia but you can also name countries like Belarus Ukraine so when the actual kinetic uh, war began we saw uh, uh, an impact where we observed a decrease in ransomware and commodity loader activity. However, uh, what uh, I guess uh, the saying goes, what doesn't kill you makes you only stronger. Towards the end of the year, um, we definitely observed a reconsolidation, reorganization of some of these uh, groups. And it appears to be that they're putting themselves in a position to uh, be more impactful in the future. Uh, as far as the war in Ukraine is, concerned that wasn't the lone uh, event that occurred. 
Uh, as some of you have already touched on, we saw an increase in law enforcement activity across the international community, uh, not only against cyber criminal organizations, but against uh, the environment that allows them to operate. For example, we saw several crypto exchanges uh, being taken over and impacted or uh, people behind some of these crypto exchanges that allowed ransomware operate, operators to launder their money uh, taken down and things like that uh, significantly impacted uh, some of these guys. And uh, we we saw groups go away, but as Eliza touched on, some of these uh, members of these groups certainly have shifted to other groups that allowed them to grow. Thanks. Good, yeah. good. Nick, um, how about you? How, how, from your position, uh, can you tell us how ransomware and, and loader uh, operators have been observed to change with the, the geopolitical environment this year? So one of the things that I found most interesting out of this is not necessarily directly related to this, but as part of the fallout. So you saw things like documents leaking out of Conti that really showed the, the SOPs and like the procedures and in some ways the, the professional manner with which these groups go after networks. That was very eye opening and educational for a lot of folks. It really helped show how structured this activity is, how a lot of it is use these tools to accomplish these goals, run these commands to achieve these gains. It makes it easier for people to get involved in the landscape. And then we see things like the Lockbit Builder getting leaked, which again will have additional impacts because now you have a lot of groups that potentially have the ability to build ransomware. And as Azim pointed out, that law enforcement attention is going to have additional impacts. I actually think you're gonna to continue to see fragmentation you're going to continue to see groups come up and quickly disband and rebrand again to try and avoid that constant drone of law enforcement. You really don't want to be the biggest, biggest player in this space because you're going to get a ton of attention on you. So being able to work and then tear your stuff down, rebrand, build a different type of, of ransomware using the same builder. Now you're up and running again and you maybe not have the same attention from law enforcement. It's like that 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 old mobster movie trope. Keep your name out of the headlines, right? Uh, Eliza, how about you? Sure. Um, well, I'd like to highlight something that Azim pointed out, um, that in the first half of 2022, we observed an overall drop in malicious cyber activity, um, which includes ransomware and loaders affecting Cisco customers. Um, so while it's impossible to determine a direct cause for this drop, um, we assessed in our end of year report that the Russia Ukraine war likely played a key role because this time frame where we saw a drop in activity against our customers roughly corresponded to the beginning of the war. Um, and also in this period, we saw heightened cyber activity targeting Ukraine as a lot of um, malware groups decided to align themselves with one side or the other. Um, we believe that many threat actors who would have traditionally been targeting entities across various geographic regions and sectors likely shifted their attention to either pro-Russia or pro-Ukraine cyber efforts. Interesting. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go in reverse order, I think, for this question. Uh, but again, to the three of you, from your experience researching uh, these, these ransomware as a service actors, ransomware actors, and, and all their affiliates, what would you like to call out about the way they've targeted their victims? Uh, you know, we've talked about their alliances and how they've related to each other, but what about the way they target their victims? Are there any notable, noticeable aspects of evolution in their TTPs, uh, specifically in targeting in, in, in 2022? Uh, let's go with uh, Aliza first. Sure. Um, so we saw a lot of operational changes in the past year as groups change their TTPs. Uh, the tools they use and the type of victims they target. Uh, for ransomware groups, we saw using, using a wider range of TTPs, uh, likely in part because ransomware has become more accessible to new cyber criminals through sale on underground forums. Since many of these individuals don't identify as part of a particular ransomware group, they're not constrained by a specific set of rules and have the freedom to use different types of techniques. Ransomware operators are also increasingly turning to cross-platform programming languages like Rust or Golang to develop more agile ransomware variants that could be difficult for researchers to analyze and reverse engineer. Um, for commodity loaders, we saw affiliates adapt their TTPs in response to enhanced security measures to safeguard devices. For example, we saw many actors moving away from using macro to deliver their payloads, which we believe was in response to Microsoft's decision 
to disable macros by default. We've also seen the loaders themselves become more agile. Um, at the In the end of year report, we cover Quackbot, Iced ID, Emotet, and Trickbot. These malwares were originally developed to perform a specific function, as you mentioned earlier, which was to work as a banking trojan. And now they've evolved to primarily operate as loaders with modular functions, allowing cyber criminals the flexibility and agility to quickly adapt to a wide variety of security environments and the flexibility to use these loaders in conjunction with a range of open source tools and newly developed malware. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out um, that did remain consistent was criminal, cyber criminals use of living off the land binaries and legitimate tools like Cobalt Strike to conduct malicious activity. This isn't really surprising because these are useful tools that allow threat actors to masquerade their malicious activity as legitimate, and we expect them to remain popular going into 2023. Hmm. So instead of finding a needle in a haystack, finding a needle in a stack of needles, right? I mean, that's yeah. looking for those LOLs. Yeah. Uh, Nick, same question to you. Um, any, any specific thing you'd like to call out in the way that these actors have targeted their victims this year? Uh, the biggest thing is they're opportunistic, right? They're going to use whatever option they have to get into your network. They can buy creds that have already been compromised. They can work with initial access brokers that have already compromised your network to get access. They can actively exploit things. They can run their own phishing campaigns or buy creds that are stolen from info stealers. Mm -hmm. Additionally, they tend to be pretty agile and work pretty quickly. So if new vulnerabilities arise, they are relatively quick to try and leverage that for their gains. Uh, we've seen that time and time again, where they'll even like uncommon vulnerabilities, they'll figure out a way to make use of it to compromise or further their access inside of networks. That really is a trend that I think is going to continue to occur. Yeah, chaining vulnerabilities is, <laughs> whew, talk about tricky defense. Azim, same question to you. On yeah, uh, Elizabeth and Nick touched on, on great things. Uh, I wanted to uh, point out some of the uh, victimology. We continue to see them uh, spending most of their time into uh, victims that kn they know have a high profit margin, for example, and uh, presumably they would think would be able to afford um, payouts. Uh, and, and along with operations that are... <clears throat> a part of critical infrastructure, if you will, a part of public services uh, like schools and uh, local government municipalities and uh, hospitals. Uh, these uh, victims continue to be targeted heavily by major ransomware groups um, for uh, obvious reasons because they think that the payout will be quick. Uh, another thing, one tactic uh, that, uh, as, as Nick mentioned, nothing is really beyond their reach. And that includes very traditional, very long established tactics, including spam phishing and social engineering. Uh, Bizarre Call is very impactful on uh, in the ransomware community, and it uses call centers that are, again, part of this expanded cartel system uh, that uh, tricks people uh, into executing malware on their machine. So uh, what, what, what's obvious is a lot of these automatic protections are great. They work. And um, maybe ransomware operators and affiliates are, as more enter the game, are seeing opportunities to do to attack using traditional methods. Uh, and that's a that's a great place, Azim. Thank you for an obligatory plug of our upcoming Beers with Talis episode <laughs> with Nick Biasini uh, joining us on ransomware is a people problem, not necessarily a technical problem. Uh, talked about that well, and that'll be up next week. So definitely tune into that. Uh, another reminder, actually, while we're at this point in the in the live stream, just reminding the audience, uh, if you're watching live, go ahead and submit your questions in the comments section on LinkedIn or with a reply tweet on Twitter, and we'll get those into queue. Uh, Madison is working to compile those now. We'll ask those on your behalf soon, so don't forget to get those in. Um, Nick and Eliza, we noted in the larger report this year that we observed the lion's share of commodity loader activity uh, in our telemetry associated with four popular Trojans in particular. Uh, that includes CACBOT, ICE-ID, and our old good buddies, Emotet and TrickBot. 
the larger market share uh, of, of those, those four in particular begged us to get a, a kind of deeper understanding, deeper insights into their operations, enhance our general understanding uh, of those four in particular. So, um, and Azim, I'll even, I'll open this up to you too, not just Nick. I know I said Nick and Aliza, but Azim as well. Can you provide us some examples uh, and how that research made a material, although maybe from the outside and visible improvement uh, and how it can defend against a specific threat? What do we gain from getting a deep understanding of, of the major, major players? Does that make material difference to our customers? Uh, let's go say more, Aliza, let's start with you. Sure. Um, so from my perspective, the more we know about these threats, the better we can protect Cisco customers. Our research and findings help us create new protections to preemptively de defend against an attack. Um, they also help us identify security breaches in the early stages of an attack and understand how to remediate the threat. In addition to our customers, our findings also inform a growing body of research produced by the larger security community. Through our published blogs, a variety of intelligence products, we, we use to communicate with our partners. Um, finally, I think it's important to remember that in spite of all the changes we outline in our end of year threat report, many affiliates still rely on some form of phishing and vulnerability exploitation to deploy commodity loaders and ransomware, underscoring the importance of updating and patching software and exercising caution when clicking on links and attachments. I'm sure that's something that most of the people watching has heard at some point or other in a security breach, and maybe it's a little bit comforting that with all these changes and new threats that are happening, um, that there's still something we can rely on, <laughs> that uh, those are definitely good measures to take to protect yourself. Fantastic. Nick, how about you? So one of the things to keep in mind with these, those four uh, loaders or commodity loaders or modular malware, whatever you want to call them, uh, are is they are a lion's share of the activity that we see on the crime landscape. It They are absolutely prolific. So that is one of the reasons why it is so important for us to track them is because they impact lots and lots of people all over the planet every single day. One of the other things that's interesting about these groups, all four of them actually, have been around for a very, very long time. So they have spent a lot of effort doing things like anti-analysis techniques, making sure to make reverse engineering and researcher work as difficult as possible. They also commonly take very long breaks. So there, it's not uncommon for a quack bot, a trick bot, or an imitet to go on vacation for a month. And the reason we do that tracking is typically when they come back from that month break, it looks nothing like it did the month before. So we hmm. do that deep tracking to make sure that we're up to how QuackBot is changing their infection chain. What type of, of files are they using to try and get users to click on things? Are they still stealing email threads and using that as a good mechanism to spread? Like those types of things come from the deep analysis and research that we do on these loaders every single day. And it would also make sense, I guess, that the, uh, the, the laggards would follow the market leaders in that regard as well. Uh, Azim, how about from your perspective? No, that's exactly all. I'm glad Nick right, led right into that. That's where, where I come in. Uh, and my job is to get into spaces that allow me to observe and collect information that allows me to track these changes, if you will, and uh, uh, pa pass these along to our incredible analysts uh, that make the direct impact to our products and to our to Cisco products and to, uh, to uh, Cisco com customers and the broader community. Um, the, the behavioral part, I think, is very important and allows us to stay proactive in some of the information that we can gain um, in the long term and be very, very, very impactful. Awesome. Uh, I have I have one more question here, and I, I we're coming up on forty ish minutes. Uh, so I have one more question, then we'll turn to our audience questions. Um, that I think I can actually roll up into one massive question so far. They seem to be aligning around a particular topic there. Mm -hmm. uh, but let's start with you, Azim, on this one. Uh, going back to Ukraine, um, bearing in mind. Like our combined efforts in helping to protect the critical infrastructure uh, of a country that is that is struck by war. Uh, can you share your your general guidance and advice to defenders who are watching on how to protect critical infrastructure uh, from sophisticated 
advanced threat actors. I mean, other than, you know, having gajillion people that you can throw at the problem, like <laughs> what is something that uh, we might want to leave those folks with uh, who are who are being faced with an advanced actor or an actor that takes on all appearances of an advanced actor, at least? Um, so uh, my, my answer is simple is, uh, to, to reach out for help when you can, it's not really just a volume of people, it's finding the right people and, uh, the right partners to, to help you not only identify the problem, but mitigate it and actually learn from it. Um, one of my proudest moments in, uh, that I think I was impactful is within Talos is actually traveling to Ukraine and establishing some of these relationships that, uh, allow us to be, uh, there for them now. And, uh, I think the quality in those relationships is the ultimate, uh, 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 you know, reward for for putting in that work and being impactful. Um, as far as uh, to defenders, um, again, communicating and reaching out, uh, I think, is is extremely important and will be impactful immediately. Awesome, uh, Nick or Elisa, do you have anything you want to add to that one? Uh, the only thing that I oh go ahead, Elisa. I was just saying that I uh, I concur with what what Azim said, and I don't I don't have anything to add. So from from my perspective, the the biggest thing I've learned is defend aggressively. Uh, we as security practitioners and vendors can do certain things to block stuff. Legitimate tools and tooling that are being used by adversaries are not things that we're typically going to be able to block. You as an enterprise need to defend aggressively. If you don't need to do business with a country, block it. Security analyst burnout is a really, really big problem. And by defending aggressively, you're going to help reduce the amount of alerts that your analysts are going to have to triage and hopefully bring to the forefront the things that they really need to be paying attention to. Additionally, don't discount the small things. Very often we see attacks in Ukraine that look like basic commodity, commodity malware, info stealer attacks, phishing campaigns. These things are very important to detect, block, and mitigate. It is not a stretch to go from a phishing campaign to a state-aligned actor being active on your network if you're not actively detecting phishes, making sure credentials get reset, making sure that you're triaging things as you find them. All of these things will help you immensely in the fight that we're in now. Fantastic. I'm, I'm looking over the, the the questions here, and I want to, um, like I said, put these into into kind of roll these up together here. Uh, and this is uh, last chance. If you do want to get another question in, please do so right now while we're answering uh, these questions, uh, and then we're going to draw to a close. Uh, but what we have right now, Amelia, so we've talked about uh, this this different uh, difference in the uh, economy of ransomware and commodity loaders today. So in this age of ransomware as a service, these ever shifting uh, allegiances and alliances between groups and between affiliate programs, uh, how do we know that these actors, and I I'm going to go with you first, Nick, because I think we talked about this just the other day. How do we know that these, uh, these affiliates aren't the same people who are working as state sponsored actors? Uh, is that, and I think that last time we talked about this, you, you talked about like a nine to five job versus a five to nine job, but, uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you. But th that seems to be like a lot of the questions around here. Are, are these state sponsored actors also cyber criminals? How do we know we aren't chasing the same groups through various, uh, same people through various groups? Um, uh, kind of, kind of those, those seem to be the questions we have right now. If you want to talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things that I always like to point out is, yes, the cybercrime industry is booming and there's tons of tons of money being made, but it's not a massive landscape. There's not like hundreds of thousands of people participating in these types of attacks. So it is very likely that you can have organizations or people that are both working for state aligned purposes and then using their off time for financial gain. And we see that in groups that kind of fall into this gray area. If you use um, Russia and Ukraine as, as an analogy, you have groups like Gamma Radon that kind of fall into this weird area where sometimes they're doing activity that appears to be state aligned. Sometimes they're doing activity that appears to be more financially motivated. Um, we had a term that we coined a few years ago, ago called privateers, which is kind of this concept of 
you have actors that are active in one or the other landscapes. Maybe they're a cyber criminal, but periodically they may have someone come tap them on the shoulder and be like, hey, we need your help with something that involves state aligned issues. Or, hey, if you get access into these networks, we need you to, to make sure that that type of information makes us makes its way back to us. That type of activity is incredibly possible, if not likely at this point, that it is happening at some level in these, in these groups. Uh, Azim, do you have anything you want to add on to that? Yeah, uh, I think Nick, Nick was spot on. Um, if you build it, you know, they will come, right? But uh, the, there's not that many stadiums, or if you will, to, to play around with. And if you have that capability, uh, it's only, um, it's, it's, it's really, with actually not much mm -hmm. impact, right, uh, for cybercrime in that part of the world. So it's really not a, not a question of if they do it, it's when and how they do it. Um, I've personally uh, have had many suspicions uh, with the work that I do within the human space uh, with um, some of the ways that these guys operate uh, definitely indicate a very high level knowledge of operational security and law enforcement uh, uh, investigations. So I certainly suspect that there is definitely a gray line there that that's crossed all the time. Fantastic. Aliza, uh, anything to add on? Not really. I, I concur with Nick and Azim. Um, you know, there are real people at the other end of these computers that it's conducting this activity. And, um, you know, they have competing, you know, wants and needs. They have maybe um, a day job and then they have a personal interest in conducting cyber activity that's financially motivated. And it's challenging to really parse out exactly what the motivations are between, you know, from, from what we're seeing, especially since, as I mentioned earlier, you have um, ransomware being open, you know, being easily accessible and sold for not that much money on underground forums that invited a whole new slew of cyber criminals into this threat landscape. And, um, you know, and they're not exactly governed by these tightly siloed groups like we've seen in the past um so uh you know that, that that's part of the reason why we track these threat actors so closely and pay such attention to their ttp so that we can understand um how dynamic this landscape is and try to get ahead of the threat rather than just responding to it fantastic and actually one, i think go ahead nick i had one last thing to point out as well Cybercrime is not a long term career. It's not something that somebody sticks at for 10, 15, 20 years. So you commonly see people get into this space, make their money or realize that law enforcement attention is getting on them and then they just leave. So it, it the long term players are few and far between. Most people don't want to stay in this in that industry for a very, very long time. <laughs> I mean, yeah, that, I mean, it just sounds to me like that we're describing a, you know, common situation where, you know, folks have a job and a side hustle. You don't need that side hustle forever. Right. I guess that's the that's the thing. I think we've actually with those answers uh, touched on all the questions in the queue um, because there's some, there's some great and broad answers there. I appreciate that. However, I do think that at 50 minutes in, that is about all the time we have for today's broadcast. Uh, so just a reminder to please grab your copy of the Talos 2022 year in review report. Share that with anyone you think would benefit from it as a resource uh, or reference document. And it's available now at blog.talosintelligence.com slash year hyphen in hyphen review, year in review with hyphens. So thank you again for the tremendous team effort to you three that it took to bring this report to life and your teams. And my special thanks specifically to Aliza, Azim, and Nick for joining us here today and sharing. Uh, this Friday, be sure to tune in for a new Talos Takes podcast on this topic, also available on the same webpage. Uh, that's blog.talosintelligence.com slash year hyphen in hyphen review. Uh, some of our podcast guests will appear on that and you'll be able to see it at that link uh, in all your other favorite podcast platforms, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever it is that you pick up a podcast. We hope you enjoy the read. We thank you again for watching today and we hope you have an amazing rest of your day. Thanks again.